Hi everyone, just going to wait a few more seconds before I start. Few more seconds. So hi everyone, thank you for joining today's Meet the Series, um, Meet the Engineer Series 5. I am your host, so I'm Delaney Salvanado, and today is our Christmas special. So we have three amazing speakers who will be talking about their journey, their story, and what they're up to. They'll be doing presentations, and in the end, we will be doing a Q&A. So this is the agenda for today. Um, our first speaker would be Alexandra Knight. Our second speaker would be Will Reynolds. And third speaker will be Daniela George. And then we will have our Q&A and we will wrap up. So um, I guess we will start going into presentations now. So I will say, Alex, you're up first. Um, you can now share your video. Super, thank you so much, Delani. Thank you for inviting me here. And lovely to be here for this Christmas special. Um, I'm really pleased to be uh, doing this as part of the IET because I love everything that the IET is doing to support engineering and technology. And thank you so much for coming along to this event tonight as well. So I'm Alex Knight. Um, I'm a chartered mechanical engineer and I've worked in industry for around 18 years before then setting up my own social enterprise called Stamazing, which I'll tell you a bit more about in a little while. So Delani asked me to share my story tonight of kind of, I suppose my journey of, uh, of engineering myself. And, you know, considering the audience, I know we've got all ages watching this. So hopefully you'll be able to take something away no matter what stage you are in your, engineering journey, whether you've not even started yet, you're just considering it or whether you're already in that. So when I was at school, um, oh, by the way, I won't be sharing any slides. I'm just gonna talk to you tonight. So I hope that's okay. You just get to see my face. Um, so yeah, so when I was at school um, studying for my A-levels, which I did maths, physics and chemistry, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, if I'm honest. Um, and it was actually my physics teacher who said to me, I've heard about this really cool sp summer space school that you can go on and like do a bit of a residential couple of days at a university. So why don't you give that a go? Because I'd obviously shown an interest in space and sort of the astrophysics side of physics. And so I went on this space school, which was actually at Brunel University, and that opened my eyes to the possibilities in engineering, because we talked a lot about different elements that go into sort of the space industry and engineering being a big one of those. And what I loved about it was the fact that you could dream about something, you could come up with an idea, and then engineering gave you the tools to turn that into reality. And so I went back to school and I spoke to my physics teacher and I said, I quite like the idea of engineering. And he said, yeah, that sounds brilliant. So that was really the point when I decided I would pursue engineering. But I really didn't, I didn't get that advice from a careers advisor at school. So I went to an all girls school 
and engineering from a careers perspective was never mentioned once. So it really was this kind of lucky break I had when my physics teacher said, try this out, that really opened my eyes to the possibilities. And then once I was at university, I, I had my ups and downs with engineering, if I'm honest. And then I found medical engineering actually to be the thing that sort of sparked my next interest level. And it was that that I used as kind of my hook to to give me the energy and motivation to finish my degree, because at times it was tough. Um, I mean, I enjoyed it, but it, it was tough for me at times. I wasn't brilliant at maths and so sort of struggled with some of the elements there. But I got through it and I actually ended up getting a first class honours, I think, because I I just found my passion at the end there and did my final year project on a medical engineering related topic. And then I went on to do a master's in medical engineering. And from that, I then went on to start to work at a small startup medical engineering company where we were designing and developing and testing uh, clinical devices for children, for pediatrics. So I was doing um, asthma monitoring and diagnosis tools. So it was a fascinating part of engineering to be involved in. And it really, again, made me realize like how pivotal engineers are in being able to help people. And that's ultimately what I wanted to do. Um, as a bit of an aside, uh, my, my sister, uh, we were in a bad car accident when we were younger and my sister was disabled as a result of that. And I've always felt like I wanted to do something to help people maybe as part of sort of wanting to help my sister in a way. And then I stayed in the medical company for a few years. And then I started to think, actually, there's a whole big wide world of engineering out there. And I'm only doing a little bit of it. And so I decided that I would join a consultancy so that I could broaden my experience and sort of exposure to different elements of engineering. And that was amazing. So I got to work on projects on submarines, um, on medical rehabilitation equipment for injured soldiers, um, some equipment for Paralympic sports. So we were designing novel uh, training equipment for Paralympic athletes. Um, I got to work on uh, power projects um, out in Thailand. So helping to get power to some of the most remote parts of Thailand and helping them with the, the systems around that. Um, I got to work on some aircraft projects amazing projects at Heathrow Airport on their baggage handling system, which is just like a massive roller coaster for, for baggage underground. It's really incredible. Um, so a whole variety of engineering projects in a whole range of different sectors. Um, and absolutely loved it. And then I moved on to another company, which was more to do with data science combined with engineering. And I worked on some brilliant projects um, looking at how to essentially turn some of our most critical infrastructure in the country into intelligent infrastructure using clever analytics and monitoring uh, technologies. And we use that cloud computing, predictive analytics, and really just that really at the forefront of what we can do with data and technology combined with engineering. So I feel really fortunate to have worked on some of those projects. However, I was finding that what I also have a huge passion for is diversity and inclusion in engineering and supporting other women engineers who are in the minority. And I just couldn't fit as much of that into my day job as I really, <clears throat> excuse me, as I really wanted to. So um, I've done a lot of volunteering in that space over the years, but I decided that I wanted to focus on diversity inclusion in engineering and also STEM inspiration for young people. And so I'd set up as a bit of a side hustle, to be honest, initially, um, a social enterprise called Stamazing. And then as Stamazing grew and I kind of was doing more work in that space um, and COVID hit and I've got two young children who I was homeschooling, it was all a bit much and I had to decide where am I gonna focus my energy? And much as I loved my sort of normal job, um, I decided to focus my efforts on Stamazing and, and just focus full time on that. So I eventually left my other job 
And since then I've been uh, building Stamazing full time, which is all about supporting and empowering women in engineering to be more confident, visible role models and linking that into STEM outreach for young children, so primary school children mainly. And Delani actually took part in one of our programs, which is called the Inspiration Academy. And she was absolutely brilliant. And uh, we've got such brilliant feedback from the school that she was engaging with. So um, if you wanna know more about that, you can look at my website, which is amazinglimited.com. And really what I'm doing with that now is, is all about trying to empower people to be more visible role models, because something that I've experienced and discovered in my engineering career is that as a woman engineer in the minority, we kind of have, I suppose, a bit of a responsibility to be visible role models, because you've probably heard the saying, you can't be what you can't see. And all the work I've done with young people and older school children is really demonstrating to me how important it is for them to see role models. And maybe you're in this position yourself, you know, how many uh, engineering role models do you know who are women? And I think it's something that we need to kind of focus on a lot more and not just saying you need to get out there and do it, but giving people in the minority the support and the tools they need to do that effectively and get you know a really a huge amount of satisfaction back themselves so one of my main things is really encouraging people to step outside their comfort zone and to put them forward put themselves forward for opportunities and so I would say no matter what stage you're at in school or university or your career one of the best things you can do for yourself is to recognize where your comfort zone ends and then consciously make the effort to step outside that and of course it will feel uncomfortable but the benefits you will reap as you cross that boundary into that zone that is uncomfortable are huge so you will definitely stretch and grow yourself as we've seen with all the women that have been through my inspiration academy you will definitely see that that really has huge rewards for you and it's one of those things that we kind of maybe need to remind ourselves quite frequently that that's okay to do that and give ourselves permission to do that so if nothing else as a takeaway from tonight I would love for you to consciously and purposefully and intentionally step outside your comfort zone when you get the opportunity and say yes to those opportunities because right back when I was at school I was nervous about going to that summer space school. Um, I was the only girl going from my school. And if I hadn't have said yes to that and hadn't have stepped out of my comfort zone at that point, then I would not have had the amazingly rewarding career that I'd have that I've had. And I wouldn't be in the position I'm in today to be able to run my own business and feel like I'm doing something really worthwhile that I absolutely love and helping lots of people. So as a takeaway, you know, engineering opens a lot of doors for you, but you have to have the courage to step through those doors. So absolutely stretch yourself um, and, and embrace the amazing world of engineering that is there for the taking. So um, I think I've talked for enough time, Delani. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to take any more questions about it's amazing or what I've done in my career at any point and obviously anybody out there is welcome to link in with me and connect and, and find out more about what I'm doing in amazing. Thanks Delani. Thank you very much Alex for your amazing presentation and inspiring um, story. Uh, I just want to remind everyone to use the Q&A chat to get your questions out there. So at the end, when everyone has finished their presentations, you can we can go through the questions. And also a reminder, if you do stay till the end of the session, you, you will see a CPD link, which will be which you can access as well. So our next speaker is Will. Um, will you be able to share your screen and video? Sure, yeah. Um, thanks very much. Okay, here we go. Um, so I think I think I'm 
the earliest in my engineering career out of 3S. I apologize if that's not correct, but um, I'm, I'm seven years out of uni, seven years into my engineering career. Um, I am I'm a 29 year old simulation engineer called Will, and I'm currently working at a medical device startup. Um, it's actually some slightly uncanny similarities between Alex and my kind of background and how we got into engineering in the first place. But I wanted to take you on a little tour through my engineering journey to date. Um, and I've got some things which I think are wisdom, um, but you should always ask around before you treat any wisdom as holy. So uh, I'll dive in and just show you what my career has looked like to this point. So I kick things off in 2010 officially with my engineering career, but of course it all starts a bit before there when I had to decide that engineering was actually what I wanted to apply for at uni. And uh, for a while I was pretty convinced I wanted to be a lawyer, uh, which is a terrible idea because I hate writing essays and I really liked Robot Wars, so I should have seen the signs. Um, and it was only actually at a careers fair at school where my physics teacher's husband brought in a mechanical gyroscope that I decided that looks pretty cool. I'd like to understand how that works. And actually, you know what? I enjoy learning about how the world works. So engineering is probably a good choice for me. So if I hadn't been to that careers fair, I might have become a lawyer. And I think that would have been a bad plan for me. <laughs> um, so what did I do before uni? Well, I studied hard at physics, maths, and I was lucky enough to have a a DT A-level and the very kind of engineering A-level working on electronics and coding as part of it. And I studied hard at that and I, I got into my engineering degree and I was pretty sure when I started my engineering degree that I wanted to do aeronautical engineering. I thought I wanted to work on planes or F1 cars or something like that. And I did not enjoy <laughs> aeronautical engineering, which was therefore really great that I did a course that was general. And it meant that in my first two years, I actually learned what engineering was. I learned a variety of different disciplines. And in my third and fourth year, I was able to specialize and focus on the stuff I enjoyed and the stuff that I was good at. And that focus led me down the route of uh, control engineering, which is a weird mishmash of mechanical, electrical, and uh, control or software skills. And just like Alex, actually, I, I found it interesting. I did I, my first two years at uni, I really enjoyed them, but I only came into my kind of into my zone in my final two years. And it was when I really got um, a purpose for what I wanted to do next. So in summer placements, I went around to a few different companies, but the one which really resonated me, with me was McLaren where I worked on their vehicle simulators and helped to develop some of the hardware and some of the control algorithms for it. And that gave me a massive boost to my enjoyment and, and actually results. So yeah, my first two years I was getting two ones and was very happy with that. Final two years, that motivation and kind of everything uh, that I was learning, clearly having a place in this this simulation engineering world I thought I was going to enter. That made it actually really nice and quite, quite calm, quite, quite relaxing to learn the knowledge and, and do well at exams. So I got that placement that motivated me. I then went on to join McLaren Applied Technologies. And this was great. I was working at a, a technical consultancy, but on some really fun funky problems. So I was developing simulations for mountain bikes, for road cars, for sports equipment. Um, I was working on medical devices and motion tracking algorithms for post-surgery rehabilitation of kind of knee, knee replacement patients. So really, really wide variety of, of, of stuff. Um, and that was great because actually for me, starting off in my career, of engineering, I'd done the learning. Now I needed to actually learn how to put it into practice. That was that was great. I got to I got to try my hand at a variety of different different areas. 
Um, and I really got to make use of the weird blend of skills I had, the mechanical, electrical, and coding skills. That, when I reflect back on, on the value of, of that, um, I think that, that spread of, of understanding across the engineering industry, it really helped me pick up new problems and able to understand the physics behind um, a mechanical problem or electrical problem or pure the data analytics problem. So that was, that was fabulous. And it was actually during my time at, at McLaren that I was able to kind of gain enough responsibility and gain enough experience in technical problems that I was able to apply for my chartered engineer status. Um, and I was proud to be the, the youngest chartered engineer of the IET at the time of applying <laughs> or the time of getting it approved. Um, and so I grew my technical understanding. I also started to gain a bit of responsibility around mentoring and managing people. And I left McLaren um, as a senior engineer rising up from a, a graduate engineer. And I decided I wanted to try my hand at something new. So I, I thought I was going to go to Babylon Health in order to develop some simulations of how the human body worked. So no longer kind of cars and oily things. Um, uh, human as a, as, a, as a new kind of system to try and simulate. And I didn't really get to do that. What I actually ended up learning was how to write really great software. So I did develop my simulation skills whilst I was there, but I was working in a, in a software company in the end, really. And it opened my eyes to, to a side of engineering that I didn't quite appreciate before. I mean, you might think of engineering as kind of learning the equations, learn how the world works. But actually, one of the key skills in order to be able to deliver any insights is really good software engineering understanding. So I didn't expect to learn it there, but but I did, and I was really grateful for, for learning that. And uh, Babylon was also very interesting for me because it was, uh, it was a company where it went public when I was at the, actually at the company. So I got to see all of that internal interactions, how a company goes from what was then a very big startup to a, a public company that is now. And then finally, I stepped over into medical um, medical engineering, really. Um, and I, I dabbled, at it, dabbled in it with, with, with Babylon for sure as a software company and also at McLaren um, when I worked on a couple of medical projects there. But now I'm at a medical imaging startup. It's very, very hands-on tech. I'm soldering, I'm analyzing data. It's really bringing together a lot of the skills that I've picked up from my degree and through my career. So this is quite new to me in some areas. It's my first startup, the proper, and uh, it's also my first um, experience of a particular type of simulation called finite elements, which some of you may have heard of. So that's my, that's my big overview. What are, what are the things that I would kind of pick out and try and share as, as kind of wisdom with you guys? Well, I think before I jump into wisdom, I'm just going to Double, in, double into a couple of points about my education, a couple of points about my experience, which I think are, are useful. So you may not have heard of an engineer like me, simulation engineer. Um, what I try and do is simulate what happens in the real world, simulate the physics so we can work out how to make that real world system or object better. And so when I was at, at uni, I worked on mechanical, electrical and control engineering problems. Um, and I actually mentioned that I got motivated to go into engineering by seeing a mechanical gyroscope. Um, and when I was at uni, I got to play with one. So that, that guy on the left-hand side, looking quite, quite pained, he is actually wrangling with one of these mechanical gyroscopes. And I, I'd recommend if you, if you look up uh, maybe gyroscope spinning chair, something like that on YouTube, you'll see how bizarre these things are. Please, if, you, if you've not seen one before, gyroscope spinning chair on YouTube, and I think you'll, you'll have a pretty intrigued uh, kind of uh, emotion. <laughs> so what, what did I think? Well, I didn't know what engineering was until I got to university, but I knew I was interested in how the world worked. And I think that's probably 
a good start and try and gain any experience you can in, in uh, any work experience around engineering if you can before, before uni. And yeah, the biggest motivation boost, the thing which made my degree enjoyable was finding something I really liked out in the real world, finding the simulator team at McLaren. That made it so much nicer, calmer, easier for me at university. And I guess what made me jump between companies? So I think it's hard to know when's the right time to leave. And I reflected on that. Um, I've got a couple of cool projects here up on the left-hand side. There's my, there's my girlfriend looking very chuffed to be in the McLaren simulator um, when we got to show our family around. Um, and so it's hard to leave McLaren. But what I wanted to do is I, I acknowledged that actually a lot of the, lot of the world's talking about data-based analysis, data-based simulation. And I wanted to get some exposure to that. So that's what moved me from McLaren to Babylon. And what moved me from Babylon to Zsen was I wanted to really get involved, have a high responsibility that I couldn't quite achieve in the big company like Babylon. And that's why I moved to a 15 person startup at Zsen. And along that way, I flip-flopped between building up management experience and building up technical skills. And I'd, I'd recommend you you dwell on that when you're in your career, about what's the right balance for you at the different stages within your career. So I've got five little pieces of, of wisdom to throw at you um, to end my presentation today. So I guess when you're starting out in your career, when you're maybe leaving uni and you're, you're joining the work world, it's a cheesy phrase, um, but before you play the game, you need to learn the rules. Um, so you may think you know everything. You know, you, you've, you've, got a, you've got a degree, you've, you've, you've done really well at some of the modules, but learn a lot from the people around you. Don't be cocky. You may know the theory, but now you need to learn the practice when you've come out of uni. I think that's important to keep in mind to be really good as an engineer. I think learning you hate something isn't wasted time. So I did work experiences and I, all of them, <laughs> before I found McLaren, I didn't actually like. But that was great because it told me where not to go, where not to spend my time in my career. And keep setting goals. So I think set, starting out or settling into your career, don't, don't get bogged down in the fact that you don't have a completely transparent path for you. When you're, when you're in school, you've got your GCSEs, your A-levels, your uni, maybe if you're in the UK, that's your route. And then you've got the massive open world of, of engineering career. So try and set yourself goals to make that mess a bit more structured for you. And so settling into your career, how do you kind of set those goals for you? Well, collect mentors. So back at school, you know, you may be motivated by teachers that really kind of captured your, uh, captured your mind. When you find people like that in your engineering career, latch onto them, ask them to be your mentor, and they'll love to be, I'm sure. And that's super powerful when you're at those, um, when you're at those crossroads in your career, and you're not quite sure which way to go. The mentors are the people you turn to. And finally, kind of when you're in the midst of your engineering career, you have to, you have to tread this line. Do, do you want to become more senior in terms of managing people? Or do you want to deepen your technical understanding? And for me, I flip-flopped. Within companies, I've gone from uh, managing a team of five, five people to being myself, trying to deliver deeply technical work. So you can shift in that. Don't get swept along a path that you don't want to understand the balance you want between tech and management. And I think that makes for a satisfying career for me to date. So that, that's what I've got for you guys. Back to Delaney. Thank you very much, Will, for your presentation. Um, I feel like I could use some of that advice as well, being from that young audience gap as well. Um, just to remind everyone, feel free to use the Q&A chat and when um, Daniela finishes her presentation, we'll be asking everyone your questions. 
Um, so, uh, Daniela, will you be able to share your screen and your presentation? I will do. Thank you very much. Let me just share it now. So, thank you very much um, for for inviting me. Uh, I'm I'm Danielle George, known to many as Dan George, um, and uh, I'm a, a professor of electronic engineering at the University of Manchester. And I was very proud to be president of the um, of the IET uh, last year when we had our 150th year, which was brilliant. Um, so, so thanks again for, for inviting me to, to come and talk about engineering. Um, uh, I think engineering and engineers are just brilliant. You know, I think we're all difference makers in, in our own way. And I think the wonderful thing about engineering that there really is something for everybody, no matter you know, what, what you're into uh, and how creative you are, there is something in engineering to, to capture that creativity. Um, I'd like just to, to share a bit uh, about, about my engineering journey, um, just capturing a few, a few things along the way. So I, I didn't always know I wanted to be an engineer. I was sort of always an engineer, I guess, but, but I started out quite a lot of similarities with Alex, actually. I, I started out doing astrophysics at, at university and, um, and it was always the practical side of stuff that I wanted to do. So, so I didn't get as great career advice as, as Alex got. Um, I, I always loved uh, math, physics and sort of putting that to work. And really somebody should have said, hey, that's engineering, but they didn't. Uh, and I studied astrophysics, but you know, hugely enjoyed it, but always did the sort of practical side of those things all the time. Um, and, uh, and that, so my sort of, my realization that I was actually an engineer and I had all the engineering habits of mind uh, was sort of later on when I was studying for my MSc. So I did an MSc in radio astronomy out of Joddle Bank. So that's what you see um, in the top left corner there. There is a, um, that's a telescope out at Joddle Bank Observatory. For, for those that don't know, it's um, in the Cheshire Plains, um, uh, not far from Manchester. We have a series of telescopes, radio telescopes out there. Um, and uh, and so so I worked out to Joddle Bank for a while, um, and um, and I and then somebody said, oh, you know, the, the stuff that you're doing, you should probably write up as a PhD. Um, uh, so so I was like, oh, okay, I'll do that. So I wrote up my work um, as a PhD, and the day I had my my PhD and had and had my viva. Um, I also had a, um, an, an interview for um, for a lectureship position at the university, um, University of Manchester. So, um, so I then moved into sort of academia um, and became a lecturer in uh, electronic engineering and um, but but still carried on doing my research. But I started teaching and teaching was like completely new for me. It was such a, an amazing new challenge for me, which was great. But then I carried on doing my research and, and I work on one of the, the 14 engineering grand challenges. So, so there are things like um, reverse engineering the brain, engineering better medicines, um, and the one I work on, which is engineering the tools of scientific discovery. Um, and so what you see on the right hand side, uh, the top right hand side is, um, is a, the very first project that I worked on, which was um, a space mission um, uh, to, to go out and study the sort of remnants of the Big Bang, something called the cosmic microwave background. And, uh, and I worked on that and continue to work in, um, in a lot of sort of the space um, and radio telescope uh, sectors at the moment. So this is uh, the radio telescope, the big radio telescope um, in the UK in, in Jodrell Bank Observatory. It's 76 meters in diameter um, and uh, it's linked up with various uh, telescopes around the world. Um, and right in the middle of it, there is something called a cryostat, which is sort of like a fridge. Um, and we cool a lot of the electronics. And the reason we cool them is just to try and get rid of the noise. So you want this really faint signal that's um, coming from, from space and, um, and you want to be able to amplify that signal, but not, not the noise. And so what I work on is something inside that cryostat called the low noise amplifier. And here you can just see a, um, a, a test amplifier we have and that tiny little black dot right in right in the middle if you can see my mouse is um is the sort of the good stuff if you like that's um something called the um low noise amplifier or the lna 
And, uh, and the reason I'm sort of bigging up the, the LNA, um, because it's, it's sort of one of the most important um, components in a telescope, in a radio telescope, um, is that that's what my research team work on. So we, we design these very, very small, uh, this one is two millimeters by two and a half millimeters. Um, uh, so these are amplifiers, tiny amplifiers on different semiconductors. Um, so it could be gallium arsenide, the type of ones we have on, in our cell phones, or it could be things like indium phosphide. So I work on, on this for ground-based and space-based telescopes. And, um, and I wanted then to sort of see how, how that sort of wireless communication side could work in other areas of, of engineering and, and maybe work on some of the other engineering grant challenges. So, um, so what, what my research team do is work with farmers as well. So, so we have this sort of amazing time where, where in the morning we've just spoken to some people at NASA and then in the afternoon we're talking to some farmers down south about, um, about their crop growth. And, uh, and so, but we wanted to try and see if we could wirelessly um, link some nodes that would be in the soil and, um, and be able, so, so a tractor would come along and um, be able to communicate with those nodes in the soil wirelessly. And, um, and it's strange because you wouldn't think there are loads of similarities between looking sort of millions and millions of years, light years um, in, uh, in distance, in the universe and then you know a few meters down in soil but actually there's quite a lot of similarities so we work with farming to do uh, wireless communication we also work with aerospace uh, what you see on the right hand side there is an image of a, a rolls-royce engine during their development stage uh, they instrument their um, gas industrial turbine engines with uh, with lots of different sensors and at the minute they're all wired and so we work with them to see if we can make them a wireless sensor network inside uh, the engine just during its development stages, not, not during flight. Um, and, um, and again, this is just trying to translate um, the, the work that we do in the space sector into a, a different sector. So in aerospace, we're trying to make uh, more efficient engines. And then with farming, we're trying to save a precious resource of water because you only irrigate part of the field that you need to, that the node tells you it needs feeding or not. So um, that's just a bit of um, background in terms of the engineering that I do um, and the, the research that, that I still carry on doing now. Um, if I just come to sort of the bottom three pictures on this slide, um, I was, um, so I'm, I'm very lucky. I'm, I'm always open to suggestions and, and people sort of saying, here's an opportunity, would you like to take it? You know, right, right from the beginning, I've sort of gone yes, yes, yes to everything. I need to sort of start saying no to things, but, um, but I'm always open uh, to, to others. Um, and I'm very lucky that I do some sort of public engagement activities as well. So on the right-hand side, what you see is, is me um, in the middle of a load of sort of robots. Um, this was a robot orchestra. I was... Um, very, very lucky to, to give the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures, um, which if you don't know them, they're sort of quintessentially Christmas for, for many people, but they're aired on the BBC every Christmas um, and have been going since uh, 1825 or something like 18, yeah, 1825. Um, and I, I gave them uh, in 2014, um, I'm eight and a half months pregnant there. Um, so thankfully, uh, my daughter Elizabeth stayed where she was supposed to stay and it didn't become a biology um, uh, lecture. It was um, all about electronics. It was all about um, engineering and how much fun you can have with engineering. And just by having that fun of engineering, you're only you know, steps away from solving those great engineering grand challenges that we've got. Um, then, um, then the, the other two um, images that, that you see are um, as part of the IET um, 150 year, where, as I say, I was extremely honoured to, to be um, our president. Um, it's such a terrific honour. I, I can't believe how quickly it went and how it's over now. But, uh, but I look back with really great pride on, on what we achieved. Um, but you know, by by everybody, not just people in the IT and the volunteers, but but by the whole engineering community and and working together to engineer a better world. One of the things that I really wanted to get out of my year as 
a president in an engineering institution was to try and inspire or help in inspire that next generation. So we we did quite a lot um, with um, Mark Rober. Don't know if, if people have come across him. He has about 18 million followers on um, on YouTube. And he, he's such a tinkerer. So he just tinkers in his garage on these like these amazing things and people sort of watch and, um, and try and sort of um, do what he's doing as well. Um, uh, Callum Daniel, the, the guy in the middle there, um, he started his own company when he was seven years old to code robots. Um, you know, just amazing people who are inspiring the next generation. Um, and just fun things like, you know, we had, um, uh, what save, save the North Pole, so helping Santa save the North Pole, it was a whole sustainability thing for children. And what you see next to it is the design that was made by children and then a, um, an amazing company uh, worked with those children to, to design that sleigh and, and, um, and actually get it out there. So, so helping to inspire that next generation, I think is, is really important. I think it's, a, it's actually part of every engineer's job. Um, we we should be talking about it we should be talking about it you know on the train at work in the pub in the cafe you know wherever you are share your passion about your subject in engineering because if you're not passionate about it why should anyone else be uh so so i think you know i'm a real firm believer all of us should be sharing our passion um for our area of um of engineering um alex mentioned uh the sort of um diversity side as well I, I think as a um as a sector we we do still have a long way to go but equality diversity and inclusion is so important um we we did a we do an awful lot you know within the IET as well about this but but generally you know it's just it's essential for engineering diversity you know if everyone has the same views the same skills the same interests and the same sort of backgrounds we're going to get a very sort of vanilla outcome and we don't want vanilla we want we want a good variety of outcomes um so so you know we we need to all of us need to promote that sort of diversity and make sure we have engineers from all walks of life um so um so raising the profile of, of engineering role models is really important um and because we need we need engineering to better represent society as well. And like I say, we do have a long way to go, but um, but there are some great things out there. Um, smashing stereotypes to bits was uh, an amazing initiative. And um, and for any young women out there um, who are engineers, please uh, put yourself forward or for other people out there, if you know an amazing young woman engineer, please put them forward for the Young Woman Engineer of the Year Awards. Um, the YWE Awards. Um, uh, Delani will know a lot about these. She was uh, uh, one of the uh, winners this year. So um, congratulations again, Delani. She was amazing. Um, but they are such a good way to just try and get out there how important it is that, that we have female role models, not just for young girls, but for young boys too, so that everybody knows female um, in engineering is just a normal thing. So, um, so yeah, have a, have a look at those. Um, if I could just sort of end by by saying thank thank you again uh, for for including me um, in in this evening's um, event. It's it's been a real pleasure. I think um, I think everybody's engineering journey is really unique, and it's down to you to own your own journey um, and to shape it. So if I could just be as bold as to to give you some advice, please do keep learning, expand your knowledge. Um, keep thinking creatively um, and get that creativity out there. Lots of people don't think that engineering is creative. It is so creative um, and, um, and make sure there's always something new to learn as well. Um, achieve your potential, set, set your sights high and keep moving towards those career goals. And if, you, and if you reach those career goals, keep adjusting them. Don't ever get complacent. Don't ever get in that comfort zone. Um, and, and be open to, to others, not only in your sector, but open to any other suggestions that come along, um, especially if it's to promote engineering in a different way as well, you know, getting outside that sort of engineering bubble as well. But most importantly, and it goes back to very similar to what Alex was saying, please do get out of your comfort zone. It is where the magic happens, absolutely. Um, uh, and, and it doesn't mean you have to achieve all the time. We have to celebrate our failures. 
Um, they are fantastic failures and failing as part of being an engineer um, and, and part of being a difference maker. You're, if you're in your comfort zone, you might feel great and everything, but are you actually innovating? Are you pushing the boundaries? No, you're not. So, so get outside of that comfort zone. It's definitely where the magic happens as well. So thank you very much for, um, for inviting me and I look forward to some questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. That was an amazing presentation, very virtual and full of pictures. And um, yeah, we'll go straight into the questions now. So um, we've already got a few questions. Um, speakers, Alex and Will, you can turn your cameras on and join us. Um, so I've got a question for you, Daniela. Um, it says, I would like to know how Daniela became the IT president. How did that opportunity happen? <laughs> um, so, uh, so I was, um, I've been a volunteer um, in the IET um, and um, I got asked to go onto the board of trustees um, a few years ago. So that board of trustees is sort of made up of um, sort of staff members of, of the IET and then a lot of sort of um, lay members, if you like, so so engineers, but people who don't work in the IET, we sort of work in, in different sectors. And so I'm on that board. And then through that board, um, I, I was asked, you know, do you, um, would you like to become sort of a vice president? And that that's sort of on a track. It doesn't mean you're going to be president, but, but you're definitely not going to be if you're not a vice president. Um, so I thought, yeah, that would be good. And then, um, then I became a deputy president, and then um, it was sort of a, um, making sure that there was sort of a vote of confidence, if you like, to make sure that that I could be president. And then the board voted for that, and then I, I became president. So, so it's sort of a, a bit of a journey, um, supporting the IET through lots of different things, and then getting on the board and and uh, growing from there. And it was brilliant. You know, I would totally recommend get in, get involved with. Uh, you know, get onto boards, get into council, you know, all of that sort of, you really can make a difference. Thank you very much, Daniela. Here's another question. This is for anyone to answer. For someone that's not from the UK, how shall they go into the engineering industry and um, also volunteering in STEM? So anyone can answer this. I mean, I'm sure we've all got some advice around that. I would suggest that, you know, getting into volunteering around STEM, there are many different organisations that you can get involved with. Um, if you haven't heard STEM Learning UK, um, you can become a STEM ambassador with them. And you have to go through a couple of checks, like get your DBS checks. But if you're in the UK and you want to deliver STEM sessions in the UK, then that's a fabulous thing to be involved with. That's one piece of advice. Thank you, Alex. Uh, anyone else want to answer the question? <laughs> Do you want to go, Will? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't really know if I have any good advice because my, my, my career has been very UK focused. Um, so nothing from me that's particularly useful. I mean, mine would just be the same as Alex. Um, you know, there's... Um... Can you still hear me? Sorry, I've just gone. Yeah, we can hear you, Daniela. Okay, yeah, mine will be the same as Alex, yeah. Okay, um, and then there's, um, yeah, I'm going to go and go ahead and ask my questions now. So um, what was it like growing up and how, um, like, if it wasn't for engineering, where would have you gone? What would you think? Anyone? <laughs> I'm happy to go first. I, so I, I, I was almost going to be a lawyer um, for no reason at all. Just I thought that was a career that I could do. Um, so uh, I remember so my mum bought some new phones for our house. And I, when she was out the house, I took them apart and destroyed them, trying to understand how they worked. So maybe that showed I should go down the engineering route rather than the lawyer route. <laughs> She didn't sue me, but that's good. Thank you very much, Will. I'll go into my next question. So what are your hobbies outside of engineering? 
so so I love I love music um and uh I have a a, a six-year-old daughter so she she keeps me pretty busy as well but but I I love um music and I think there's quite a lot of common things and quite a lot of people who are into engineering really like music as well I don't know if it's sort of the patterns or something within music but um but yeah I think it's quite common I think with engineers Would anyone else like to go ahead? Go on, Will, you go, and then I'll go. I got this, I got all this wacky stuff around me because I, I also make puzzles for escape rooms. So um, I, I'd like to try and have fun with, uh, with engineering. Um, I've got a, got a puzzle in an upcoming game that uh, involves using Tesla coils to light up fluorescent bulbs and things. And so I'd like to try and see how I can show people a bit of physics in a game setting that they would not normally see. And that's a nice use of my coding and soldering skills and uh, some of those very kind of hands-on engineering skills. I love that, that's amazing. I'm gonna have to check some of those out. That sounds awesome. Um, for me, I've got, I've got two young kids, so they do keep me busy. I've got a six-year-old and an eight-year-old and also a puppy is a recent addition to keeping us very busy. Um, to be honest, I love just, um, being out in the countryside I do find like I'm the kind of person that I need headspace to think and the my like creative thoughts come through when I'm basically out in nature and and no other distractions no screens so I find that is really really useful for me um I also love just like this is a bit geeky but just like coming up with little stem experiments that I do with my kids and like my two kids and my guinea pigs for all our amazing kids experiments. So I try and just create fun things that we can do together. And then I'll turn that into a amazing kids session that I do with, with schools. So, um, but yeah, nature is a big part of my spare time. Hence just having moved up to Northumberland uh, where we are now surrounded by nature, which is awesome. Thank you very much, Alex. I'm gonna be asking individual questions now. So Daniela, um, you worked at the Jordel Bank Observatory. Did you see any aliens or find any stars? <laughs> no, no aliens uh, that we know of anyway. Um, but I mean, yes, lo lots of stars, um, exploding stars. Uh, the, the telescope I work on at the minute is in the Atacama Desert in Chile. So there are 66 dishes. They all work together and, um, and they are, they're the most sensitive in, in the world, um, radio telescopes in the world. And, um, and they were looking at a really young star um, about 1.5 million kilometers away. And, um, and this star had exploded. And when it exploded um, using the um, telescopes in, in Chile, we looked and found that there was salt was glowing from, from the center of the star. So normal table salt, sodium chloride um was glowing and um and we still don't know why so it's lovely to, to sort of be involved in something like that and um and you know just discover new things but yeah there's salt glowing just from this really young star it's great that is pretty cool to hear Daria. thank you question for will so you took a different route to engineering working at mclaren are you friends with any famous people, maybe Lando Norris? And did you support any F1 teams? <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, unfortunately not. I don't think I know any, any famous people. I, I, le I learned drums on Blur's first drum kit. I think that's my claim to, claim to musical fame. Um, uh, I was very excited with the F1 race this, this, year, oh, this, this weekend. And uh, actually, I didn't. I didn't really care about F one when I joined McLaren. Um, I think it's a testament to, to telling a story really nicely that probably people on this call have watched Drive to Survive, and that's got them enthused about F one. Um, so, a lot of cool stuff can be happening, and like an exciting sport and exciting piece of tech can be being developed. But if you don't tell a good story around it, then you're not going to get people excited about it. So even for me, it's only since I watched Drive to Survive a few years ago now that I actually got passionate about Formula One. 
Thank you very much, Will. Very interesting to hear. And now a question for Alex. So you've moved around the engineering industry a lot and you've won many awards. Would you like to talk more about that? Uh, I, I don't know if I've won many awards. <laughs> I've won a couple of awards. Uh, yeah, so I mean, when I was, this is in my first consultancy I was in, I was really fortunate to be part of a team working on some amazing projects for UK sport and uh, also relating that into medical projects in the NHS. So we were looking at how you could use basically like elite monitoring tools that Paralympians use when they push wheelchairs to get feedback on exactly the angle of their push force and you know if they're equal on both sides things like that so they can go in a straight line as fast as possible we were using that to feed into um, NHS projects to help with rehabilitation of people who just gone into wheelchairs to help them avoid getting things like shoulder injuries and stuff which is quite common when you first start using a wheelchair so some of those projects I was working on that got a bit of press attention and kind of led to me getting um, uh, an award when I was you know, quite young before I had children or anything. Um, and that showed me the importance of, I suppose, the visibility of what you're doing in engineering and how important, you know, we're all doing amazing things, but it's really important to tell people about them, raise the profile of those. And that helps raise your profile, but it also helps raise the profile of engineering and gets people aware of all the cool things that are happening. So that was one of the first... I suppose, um, moments when I thought, right, I have to talk about this more because we're all doing cool stuff. Um, and, you know, getting articles into magazines and newspapers about what you're doing helps the rest of society who have no idea really what engineers do get a little glimpse into what it is. Um, I've also, you know, so I'm really proud of the fact that it's amazing this year won a diversity impact award for the work that we've been doing with you Jelani as well as part of the Inspiration Academy um, so yeah really really happy about that because I feel like that's where my passion lies for making a difference and I'm really pleased that in only the two years really since I've been since I've started it's amazing that we're already having some impact so yeah I'm very happy about that. Thank you very much Alex I think we have time for one more question so this question is from one of our audience Taking a risk can lead to new discoveries and directions as it forces you from the status quo. What's the biggest risk you've taken and where did it lead? What advice would you give others? So anyone can answer this question. I think probably Alex and I were saying the same thing in terms of advice, weren't we? Just get out that comfort zone. You know, um, it's it really is where the magic happens. Um, I mean, I... I, um, for me, in terms of what, what's gotten me most out of my comfort zone was probably doing things that are, that are not technical. I sort of feel in my comfort zone when I was doing that, but, but sort of saying, right, I need to put myself out there a bit more and tell other people about engineering. That massively got me out of my comfort zone. Going on television when you're eight and a half months pregnant, massively out of my comfort zone. Um, you know, and, and talking about um, engineering and technology, great experience. And, and I'm so thankful I did it. But, but at the time, it was super scary. Thank you very much, Daniela. Anyone else? Yeah, I mean, I would say, I feel like in my career, the biggest risk I've actually taken was like, stepping off my career ladder, and starting my own business. Because there was a, definitely a certain element of comfort blanket in always kind of knowing where your next step was coming from and feeling like you've got an organization around you supporting you. So there's always somebody who knows something that you can ask, you know, there's always somebody who knows more than you in, in an area and you can get the support. So for me, that was a really scary thing saying, I'm going to leave that job title, that job security, you know, all of that behind and go out on my own. But I felt so strongly that I wanted to do that. And I, you know, we obviously had to make quite a lot of, like, I don't know if I call them sacrifices, but changes in our 
family life to enable me to do that. I didn't have my salary from being a technical director in a London firm anymore. And so that was a big change, but absolutely worth it. And I kind of felt like I have to like live my own values. I'm constantly telling people I mentor and things, no, look at look at this opportunity. If you really want it, if it aligns with your values and you care about it, do it. What's the worst that can happen? You can always change and go back. You don't, it doesn't have to be forever, but you've got to try. And so I like took my own advice and haven't looked back. <laughs> Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, Will, would you want to answer that question before we end the session? Yeah, I think I think for me, the riskiest thing I've done has been moving company every time. And it's because it feels so risky because you feel so comfy. You know where everything is, you know how to do the work. And that that's, that's the time when maybe start to feel a bit bored. You look for what's next. And this is where I think you need to make sure you've got people that you respect in the industry around you because there's very few wrong decisions for your career I think it's just important to get motivated about the route you decide to take next and you can't really get that from your your mum and dad or your friends you really want to get that from someone who knows about the industry so collect mentors Thank you very much, Will. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending the sessions. Thank you very much, speakers, for giving up your time to share your journey, story, and your advice. If you haven't already, follow us on social media. And if you have any more questions, feel free to find our speakers on LinkedIn and ask them questions on there as well. Um, feel uh, Stay in touch. Uh, keep up to date with our social media. We'll be telling you or letting you know when our next event will be. So we won't be having one in January, but we will start and come back on February. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you have a nice evening. See you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Delaney. Thank Bye. you.